Is it time? It is time for us to do what we have been doing, and that time is every day. We'll know in a very short period of time, but it looks like it could be something that will be uh, not good. Believe me, not good. Um, so, uh, you know, I see issue with yeah, that, and okay, again, yeah, you're, yeah, hey, yeah, hey, yeah, hey, 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 uh, You're not going to be able to insult your way to the presidency. That's not going to happen. I don't know who created Pokemon Go. Go. But I'm trying to figure out how we get them to have Pokemon go to the polls. I'm Ted Cruz, and my pronoun is kiss my ass. So when you think about it, there is great significance to the passage of time in terms of what we need to do to lay hey, these wires, hey, hey, hey. what we need to do <laughs> to create these jobs. We will not get you. America is a nation that can be defined in a single word. I was going to put him in uh, foot, foot. Not good. Believe me, not good. What's up, everybody? Welcome, one and all, to a special late night, impromptu, last minute edition of the Do Dissidents podcast. Hope everybody's doing well. Keaton Weiss here with Russell Dobular. Hello. We are dealing with uh, another technical issue. This time, it does not affect you guys, uh, but it does affect our egos because, according to our StreamYard software, we have two people in the audience. Two. That's all we got, too, which showing up on our end. It shows us how many viewers we have in real time. And I know we have almost 100 in the YouTube uh, room right now, but for some reason, the YouTube audience numbers are not populating to our uh, software, and so it's really it's really hurting us. It's really hurting us. We feel like we're playing to, to nobody here, but we know we're it's not. Ju- it's just Mika and Virtuoso. Yeah, right. <laughs> Exactly. exactly. Uh, it's just the four of us. They they won the raffle. This is like date night with the yeah. new dissidents guys. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Hey, if you want to uh, boost our egos a little bit, how about a super chat? Nothing like a super chat gets our spirits up. Let us know you're out there. Yeah, 95. Screw Google. Uh, screw Google. I see you right there. I see that. Yeah, I see it uh, on our end because I just wanted to make sure that there was nothing broken on our end. There's clearly something going on with the website. I'll have to write them a little email uh, on the way out the door. But speaking uh, of out the door, uh, we're here. We're going to play an hour set for you guys, a little impromptu improv this evening. Uh, because at 11 p.m. Eastern, Russ and I uh, will be featured on the Misty Winston show. Our friend Misty uh, is inviting us back to her TNT radio show. That link is tntradio.live. In the Substack invite email, I misspelled it. I put tntradiolive.com. I apologize about that. It's tntradio.live. So we hope that at 11 p.m. Eastern, you guys switch over to uh the misty winston show on tnt radio um and look us up over there we will be having a late night conversation uh with misty as well she's a good pal of the show and uh, i had a great time guesting on her show while russ was in india and now russ and i will both be on her show at 11 p.m eastern tonight but we did want to come on here long island sounds trying to start shit oh you're starting to trying to start shit up Trying to start shit up. Well, those guys were little itty bitty witty guys 20 years ago when the Iraq war started. And that is part of why we are gathered here this evening. And thank you guys all for showing up. Please hit that like button and please hit that subscribe button. I'm not going to be able to monitor on my phone how many of you rascals are in here because I got to save my battery in case Misty needs to call us uh, for any reason. Pickle the Pirate. Can't believe the fraud squad could fall any further. Yeah, no, we are going to talk about that, that, that this that's evening. That's how for I sure. feel. You know, for a long time, I kept that postcard from when I campaigned for her first time around on my bookcase. It's been a long time since I was proud of it in terms of her, but it's something that I did. So I felt like I was, and now I can't even see it. I, I put it in the, I put it in the back. I put it in the back room where, where of broken toys. And right. Broken dreams. That's where that went, along with my Bernie signs, my T-shirts, all of that. Yeah, 
Yeah, no, look, it's a very sad thing. Um, but we wanted to come on here because, A, we have to be up late tonight anyway. So we figure, why not come and do a stream and hang out with you guys while we're waiting for the clock to strike 11 when we go on Misty's radio show? We, we, we actually, these guys keep going on about the Vanguard. We are going to be debating the Vanguard. The subject is going to be whether you should do your podcast from your parents' basement or not. <laughs> well... The Vanguard, yeah, we have a lot of people trying to get us uh, to debate the Vanguard. I don't know what we would debate them over. Yeah, sorry, uh, sorry. Russell actually invited Nathan Robinson <clears throat> to debate him. I'd be far more interested in seeing Russell debate Nathan Robinson on Marianne Williamson, actually, because uh, Nathan Robinson just put out a piece defending Marianne, so that would be kind of an interesting debate. Um, and he also put out an article on wokeness, which I think would be a very good debate for Nate and Russ. If we're going to debate, I'm going to have Russell do it because I don't think it's fair to invite someone on and then double team them. Two yeah, on one. exactly. You know, exactly. I would basically moderate it and they would, uh, have at it, but yeah, that would be far more interesting than, uh, debating any of the Vanguard guys, I think. Yeah. We're not, we're not, we're not the kind of people to invite people on our show and then be yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, we don't do that kind of thing. Um, yeah, no, he, Nathan, I've wanted to debate him on this for a while because um, it, 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 I've started reading the article. I haven't finished it yet, but he's been on this train for a long time. I I, I don't really know why. Um, I, I like his take very often on politics and economics. Um, but uh, yeah, he's been one of those who's been like, cancel culture? What cancel culture? Nah, 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 nah. La, 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 la. He's, he's been like that for years. And so now he wrote an article arguing we shouldn't use woke because people can't define it. So, and at, come on, man, you're a dishonest actor. You've been running around for years trying to claim that none of what it does define even exists. So you shouldn't even weigh in on this. Um so, yeah, I, I think I might debate him on this because I've wanted to debate him on this whole thing for a long time. Like, really, there's no cancel culture. There's no nothing, really nothing. When people talk about woke, there's nothing. There's nothing going on. That that would be an interesting discussion. I I mean, I, I was going to say, I don't know how you get there, but I do know how you get there because I, I've read his articles about it. And it's just really just ostrich, just putting his head in the sand and refusing to see what's right in front of him. Well, that would be, yeah, like I said, I think that would be a very interesting debate. So I'd be up to host that if we could make that happen. Jessica says, bring Bob Shear on. Yeah, that would be a really fun show to bring Bob Shear on, who does the Shear Post. Chris Hedges writes the weekly column for him. Uh, yeah, he's, he's an old giant of this space before there even was this space. So, uh, yeah, that would, be, that would be something, actually. You know what? That's a good idea. I might just take your advice jessica and see if i can reach out to him because that would be that would be actually great i would love to do that um so thank you anyway um we are going to do you know a few segments tonight like i said this is sort of an impromptu informal hangout it is the 20th anniversary of the iraq war which started on march 20th 2003 i dressed for the occasion believe it or not this t-shirt says Right here, Raisin in the Sun, Arts at NFA. That is my high school, my public high school in Newburgh, New York, 2003. What, 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 they have a cast of like five white kids do Raisin in the Sun? No, no. Uh, I was the sole white kid in the cast. I played Linder, the real estate agent who tries to convince the black family not to move uh, okay. from Chicago out to the suburbs. And um, that was, I was a, a sophomore in high school. Weren't you um, upstate? I thought you were upstate. I'm in Newburgh. I'm 60 miles north of the city. All I've right. told you this before. I grew up in a very, very diverse town. Oh, that's it right. Was a, that's you right. know, yeah. majority, minority school district. And um, we had just, my high school had just gotten a black box theater the year that I happened to start there. We started high school in 10th grade in my district. It was K through 6. Junior high was 7, 8, 9. High school was 10, 11, 12. And the musical that year was How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying, which is a heavy male cast. There are lots of yeah. men in that cast, obviously, because like the 50s mm -hmm. white collar business scene. And so right. all the juniors and seniors were in the musical, which left an opening for the one white role in Raisin in the Sun for me, even though I wouldn't have had a shot if I had to compete right. against the juniors yeah. and the seniors. But I auditioned and I got the part. 
and shows what a what a class conscious person I've always been. I've always been more a class warrior than a race warrior. I told the drama teacher, I said, what if I play him not as a bigot, but as someone who really doesn't like having to do what he's doing? Because that brings the class element forward a little bit. Like if he's just a, if he is a bigot personally himself and he's trying to keep this black family out of the suburbs, out of pure hatred and malice, that's kind of boring. Isn't it more interesting if he doesn't like this part of the job, but he has to do it because he can't have property values go down if black mm -hmm. people move in? I thought that was a more interesting take on the character and she did it too. But anyway, 20 years ago, we were in rehearsals for this play in my high school this shirt is in very very good shape uh, all things considered that i've had it for 20 years now um but as we were rehearsing this play yes the iraq war started 20 years ago today and this was a wow. really formative experience uh for me i was 16 at the time um you know the iraq war is really what made me a politically conscious person especially uh being a kid that age with a father who's you know been in the chat a few of our shows some of you guys get an idea of the kind of guy he is you know when he gets an idea in his head he can't let it go so he was obsessed with this news all while it was happening and that obsession really uh permeated the entire household we were all very consumed by the day-to-day -day goings on of the iraq war just this, as he's very this, consumed this, this keaton's origin story it's my origin story well now you could see i mean it's funny he calls me whenever we're, we're going to do a show and he knows we're going to do a show he says are you talking about the nord stream pipeline later i said well not necessarily unless there's something new that happened with the story that we can comment on he says but he's like well i don't understand why everybody's not talking about this all day every day i said well because you know there are other things happening and if there's no news on that front why would we cover it but you know that's the kind of guy he is so the iraq war was front and center um in my mind especially in the early days of it and as especially as a teenager you know i grew up in the 90s i grew up in the end of history it was right here right now that was a period yeah, yeah. where yes there were shenanigans going on around the world iraq obviously that, uh, uh, man i i what are you 37 36 i'll be 37 in december so i just turned 36 a few months uh, ago no. yeah so i grew up in a in a period of relative peace not that we weren't fucking with the world as we always have but the 90s were a time of relative stability at least here at home 9 11 obviously shattered that but it was you know a political unifier for obvious reasons uh but then to see the bush administration just totally squander all of the goodwill that they had been gifted um and take us down this path that was just so obviously a road to ruin and there were so obviously going to be so many hundreds of thousands of corpses um that just lay in their wake um it was just a very tragic situation and just a horrible situation it was my first experience thinking about this stuff in a in a way that that felt real that didn't feel like it was under glass like you were reading history and so you know that more than anything else really informed uh my political development that's why i said i, I never really i've never been radicalized because i went from not paying much attention to this stuff as most 14 15 year olds don't to having very radical anti-war political views, right? I mean, there was never a second where the Iraq war made any sense to me whatsoever, even as a teenager. Even in September and October of 2002, this is one year uh, after 9-11, when you started hearing the war drums start to beat, you know, it took about five or six months for them to build support for the Iraq war. You started seeing it appear on the headlines in a, you know, late summer, early fall of 2002 and it wasn't until six months later that the shock and awe campaign formally launched but um we figure we should come on since we have some time to kill before our radio spot at 11 p.m and uh this is the most <clears throat> people have talked about the iraq war in recent memory because it's an anniversary and i think it's quite uh ironic and quite chilling that a lot of the liberals who are now reflecting on their ill-advised support for the iraq war 20 years later are at the same time championing the third world war and i sent out a tweet a little bit earlier to the effect of um you have a chance to be right a little bit sooner this time right just look back the anti-war 
faction is almost always right. Almost mm -hmm. always. Mm -hmm. 999 times out of 1,000 people saying, hey, let's try another way. They end up being right. So don't be stupid. Don't be stupid. Try and get out a little bit ahead of the curve this time. Well, I, I, I saw I saw one of the shittiest shit libs I know posting about 20 years ago today, the Iraq war started. It was a it was a terrible mistake and it undermined a lot of faith in our institutions. What were you saying at that time, motherfucker? Yeah. Because if you were speaking out against it, I'll eat my hat. OK, I'm sure you were one of those assholes talking about how we had to go in and 9-11 uh, and, and all that bullshit. I mean, that that was the page everybody was on until Katrina. It was really Katrina that turned the narrative around the Bush administration. It wasn't any specific thing that happened in Iraq. They were cheerleading Iraq right up until Katrina. And well, once Katrina happened, they started questioning everything about the I Bush mean, that, administration. You're you're definitely right that Katrina definitely tanked the the Bush administration's poll numbers to the point where they could never come back. Um, but you know, the war. Um, I'm sorry, support for the war was in decline through the 2004 it, it campaign. It was in decline. That's why the election the was close. But the press so the election still... wouldn't have been close if the numbers stayed where they were at the start. At the start, 70 percent supported the war. Right. And then by 2004, it was down around 50. Right. right. But it was still. But it was, it was, still, right but at 50. It was still. But it was still a 50. And and right. the press. The press really did not deal with the Bush uh, administration like the pack of dunces and criminals that it was until after Katrina. There was a sea change in the way that those press conferences went after Katrina, even in something completely unrelated like Iraq. They were they were pretty deferential about Iraq up until Katrina. I, I still remember John Stewart. He had a he had a great moment where he was showing the press really hammering Bush's press secretary. I can't remember which one it was at the time. And John Stewart showing the clip of the of the press secretary clearly frazzled, getting just peppered with questions. And John Stewart came, comes back, goes, Oh, the free press. Right. Wh where have you guys been? Because it was so palpably different from how they had dealt with the Bush administration up to that point. And today, watching so many people just, oh, did you see when he shared a candy with Michelle? And that's, you know, that's what Trump has taken away from us, that spirit of bipartisanship. You know, Bush was an honest Republican you could have disagreements with. He didn't ruin Thanksgiving. Jesus fucking Christ, did you have a frontal lobotomy? Do you literally have no fucking memory of how tense things were between conservatives and liberals over George Bush? You, you don't remember how George Bush was a criminal? It was the most criminal administration ever. Only in that case, it was actually fucking true. It was true. And the things that he was doing were not tweets. These were not yes. tweets. That This was hundreds of thousands of lives lost because of the decisions of this person. And that's why for me personally, no matter what Trump sits, I never regarded these people with anything other than fucking contempt. Because at the same exact time that they're talking about, oh my God, it, Russia and, and porn stars and all, at the same exact time, Ellen's dancing with George Bush. His, his poll, he, he's actually in, in, the, in the green with Democrats now. George Bush is now over 50% approval yeah, with Democrats. So you're going to come to me and tell me how offended you are about Donald Trump? How am I supposed to take that seriously? Yeah, not only were the crimes of George Bush, uh, you know, infinitely more severe in every respect, but the media covered his ass in unison, as opposed to now during the Trump years, the, the, the media makes up fake bullshit crimes that Trump didn't do, <laughs> and they run 24-hour news stories about them. Whereas during the Bush years, yeah, man, and e there's stuff we didn't even remember. There's stuff we don't even remember now. In August 2001, pre-9-11, which this was obviously memory hold uh, for understandable reasons, there was a whole scandal that came out that the Bush White House, the White House, not a department of this or that, the White House itself 
would doctor the EPA's uh, reports to take climate change, the words climate change, out of it. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah, that ain't yeah. hush money to a porn star. I understand that's not as severe as that. But once again, this is just where it comes down to like, okay, if you actually care about things, if you actually care about the world, how is that not infinitely more consequential, right? Well, Doctoring well, the words climate change out of your EPA's reports. Well, well and even the whole, hush money to a porn star. the whole attack on the press, really, the Bush administration laid the groundwork for this idea of truthiness of what is truth it's a you know interestingly postmodern take that the bush administration had on the idea of the telling of truth well whose truth is my truth the same as your truth you know they get right they, they, that that was that and and i believe it was cheney who said people have to be careful what they say right now this was after we had gone into iraq and they're you know, talking about treason and people being traitors, and yeah, people forget that now. People forget yeah. that now. I, I'm, I'm going to dig into that for, uh, for the segment I'm, I'm doing on Sunday. But, um, seeing George Bush get rehabilitated at the same exact time that all the blue MAGA people were losing their mind about Trump, I mean, that illustrated where their politics are and what their politics are about better than anything else I can think of. They do not have principles. They do not have politics. They have it. They have an addiction to a certain type of media whose business model is to get you angry and to present the world in a very black and white oppositional way. And this really appeals to most people because most people are kind of dumb, empty, insecure, and confused. And they're looking for direction in the absence of religion, and they find a religion in these narratives. Exactly. Exactly. And speaking of the media, we should play perhaps the most infamous media clip from that era. This is uh, Thomas Friedman, of course, liberal in good standing to this day, writes op-eds for the New York Times to this day. This is a couple minutes long, but I feel like we should play this uh, just to give you an idea what real fascism was like, right? What actual fascism was like. We oh, had yeah. it here not oh, too yeah. long ago. Oh, yeah. Some say it's never left. I think you can make a case for that. But you had really in an in, a, in, an in your face way. Here's Thomas Friedman. The terrorism bubble that basically built up over the 1990s said, flying airplanes into the World Trade Center, that's okay. Wrapping yourself with dynamite and blowing up Israelis in a pizza parlor, that's okay. Because we're weak and they're strong and the weak have a different morality. Having your preachers say that's okay, that's okay. Having your charities raise money for people who do these kinds of things, that's okay. And having your press call people who do these kind of things martyrs, that's okay. And that built up as a bubble, Charlie. And 9-11 to me was the, the, the peak of that bubble. And what we learned on 9-11 in a gut way was that that bubble was a fundamental threat to our open society. Because there is no wall high enough, no INS agent smart enough, no metal detector efficient enough to protect an open society from people motivated by that bubble. And what we needed to do was go over to that part of the world, I'm afraid, and burst that bubble. We needed to go over there, basically, um, and um, uh, take out a very big stick um, right in the heart of, of that world and, um, and burst that bubble. And there was only one way to do it. Because part of that bubble said, we've got you. This bubble is actually going to level the balance of power between us and you because we don't care about life. We're ready to sacrifice, and all you care about are your stock options and your hummers. And what they needed to see was American boys and girls going house to house from Basra to Baghdad um, and basically saying, which part of this sentence don't you understand? You don't think you know, we care uh, about our open society? You think this bubble fantasy, we're just going to let it grow? Well, suck on this. Okay. Suck on this. Robert Pena, 
Robert Penner, friend of the show, saw it coming. He knew what we were getting at. So there you have it, folks. That's like liberal in good standing, Thomas Friedman. He just wrote an article that we covered in our Patreon-only segment, what was it, about six months ago? My Lunch with Joe. Oh, right? yeah. <laughs> Lovely op-ed about his nice lunch at the White House with the president, crediting Joe Biden with putting NATO back together. Suck what? on this. He goes on to say in that clip that, yeah, we could have attacked the Saudis, since the hijackers were Saudis, but we attacked Iraq because we could, because mm -hmm. we could. That's why we attacked Iraq. Well, he, he, Friedman is a little Trumpy that way, where he's too stupid sometimes to filter out what he should say out loud. You know, right. he, he he reflects elite opinion as it's expressed in Georgetown uh, living rooms. You're not supposed to do that when you're on Charlie Rose. Well, at the time, you could. At the time, that was not considered a controversial well, statement. Well, sure. I mean, he's he's still got a job. All the all the, all these people, they all they all failed up. Bill Crystal, Bill Crystal. This guy's you know he's welcome on every panel. Uh, you know, a bit anti Trump. Oh yeah, good Bill Crystal. None of these people faced any consequences, and watching them get rehabilitated was just it it just puts the lie to everything that liberals claim they believe in you could almost respect it if they actually had convictions but they really don't they don't actually believe in anything if the media can turn you on a dime to rehabilitate one of the worst pre and most dangerous fundamentally dangerous presidents in american history at the same exact time that you're losing your mind over this president because he's doing this Rodney Dangerfield slobs versus snobs thing, and you're the snob and you don't like it, and that's more important to you than a war criminal. A war criminal shares a candy at a funeral and you got a tear in your eye, and I'm supposed to take you seriously when you talk about the crimes of Donald Trump? Are you right. fucking You're a kidding fucking me? joke. Yeah. You're a fucking joke. I mean, you're just a joke of a person. And that's, you know, that is, uh, that's 65% of the Democratic Party electorate. If I can use an opportunity once again to drive home my point, that's what you're dealing with. That is what you're dealing with. Well, we're dealing with crazy, day, crazy eyes with the rotten bananas that we did the uh, segment. Well, not just crazy eyes with the rotten bananas, but AOC herself, which is a good segue into the second piece of this. So here's a lovely little flyer that we saw circulating Twitter. Student Services Fair, hosted by yes. representatives Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Adriano Espeyat. They are the two Congress people from uh, New York City, uh, or two of several Congress people from New York City, not the only two, obviously. Uh, but it says here, join us to learn about the resources available to students through our district office. This is at the Renaissance High School Auditorium. This was this afternoon in the Bronx. We will be joined by special guests from the United States Naval Academy, the United States Air Force Academy, the U.S. Military Academy, the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy, the U.S. Coast Guard Academy, and the Department of Education, as well as former congressional interns. So it sounds like pretty much a job fair for the United for the States military. military. Yeah. A military recruitment expo co-hosted by Russell's congressman, Mr. Espeyat, and of course aoc so there you have it now aoc as recently as 2020 was against military recruiting in high schools and a few years later man that didn't take long didn't take long to bend her on that at this point you can't even make any kind of excuses for her. like i i've gone on not lately, because she's gotten worse and worse. But I, I have very often tried to see it, see it from her side. You know that, you know she came in there very idealistic, but you you're you're dealing with you know the Illuminati over here, and it's it's probably terrifying, and 
they probably show you pictures of your extended family members and show you that they know where they live and you know she's probably dealing with a lot of that but at this point i come on man i that's you know some people are running around saying hey she interned for ted kennedy you don't just get a job like that she's always been a psyop you know i'm not i'm not inclined to that kind of uh you know a conspiracy theory unless there's strong evidence for it but it is kind of amazing that she fell this far like everything else she's done up to this point i could explain within the context of getting thrown into this corrupt system as a very young woman and them just chewing you up and spitting you out this is another level like why do you do why would you agree to do something like that it's so against everything you ran on, everything you supposedly believe in. I know her seat is secure because now the Democrats definitely aren't going to primary her. And a Republican right. just cannot win in that district. No way. So she's she's going to, yeah, I, you know, people who said a while ago they were ahead of the curve. People were like, this is going to be Nancy Pelosi. She's going to be Nancy Pelosi in 20 years. Yeah, now you see it. She's going to she's going to sit in that district forever. You're not going to be able to get her out of there with dynamite. And if she got this corrupt, not what? She's only been in there four years, a little over four years, and she's this corrupt already. Oh my God. She's gonna she's she's gonna put Pelosi to shame. Would Pelosi make a hundred million? She's gonna make uh she's gonna make two hundred and fifty million. I mean, she's probably halfway there on the Instagram ad revenue alone. But probably you never know, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, no, just, I mean, a uh, fairly incredible development. Uh, obviously, um, Robert Penner, Jose Vega, I'm assuming you mean, and friends better be there tonight. Let's just say we have it on pretty good authority that uh, Jose Vega was, in fact, in the building. Let's say, let's say we, we heard, we heard that. A little birdie uh, told us. A little birdie told us that. Chris Bishop, in 2003, I was against the Iraq invasion. Everyone hated me. In 2023, I am against escalation in Ukraine. <laughs> Everyone hates me. I, see it, but I don't know exactly. That, that was exactly my point. That, that's, that's what I opened with. That's what I tweeted out earlier. It's like, you know, I mean, look, I never bought it. And I think part of the reason why I never bought it is because I grew up with war being this abstraction, right? And then when 9-11 hits when you're 15... All of a sudden, that changes the world in a real way, in a very scary way, where you see violence as this really horrible and very frightening invasion of your life, right? When you grow up as a kid in the 90s, you think, oh, yeah, war, that's something that used to happen, right? It doesn't really happen anymore. And then when 9-11 happened to someone who lived close to the city, but even people from all over the country were just very traumatized by that, that creates a certain stakes, in your mind to the point where if you see violence as this just horrible affront to civilization which it is then you obviously must view war in that way which means if you're going to start a war it better fucking be justified and to me as a teenager i could tell this war was nowhere near justified nowhere near justified and now you have the same escalation happening here slightly different situation obviously because we don't have our troops there yet, but you could still see, I mean, the same principle is at work, which is shouldn't the role that we play as a third party be to broker peace, not to pour fuel in the fire? Isn't that obvious? And I feel like it will be obvious to people in 20 years, just in the same way that the Iraq war was obviously a disastrous mistake. 20 years later it is now conventional wisdom that that yeah. was a disastrous mistake you don't hear anybody argue the merits of the iraq war no that even the apologists even the most vocal hawks at the time like crystal and from they've weaseled out of it you know by saying yeah it was a mistake i mean of course we had considerations that we had to make you know they try and acquit themselves as best they can but even they can't go all the way there's just no way to yeah, no, I think in the uh, in the ruins of the supermarket, as people scrounge for cans, they're definitely going to be saying that was a mistake, that Ukraine thing. Right. But by then, you know, you got fallout to deal with. You got to hope your DNA can mutate fast enough right. to survive the, the apocalypse. 
Um, with this story, we didn't line up, um, and we'll see how it evolves over the course of the week. You know, the State Department uh, spokesperson actually said that China brokering a peace would be unacceptable and possibly illegal. <laughs> peace is illegal. <laughs> Our State Department said that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, he was, even he was saying... Go ahead. He, he said he said it would go against U.N. Security Council resolutions, basically that it would be illegal, that this would not be acceptable to have a ceasefire. It's going to allow. So so not nothing, well, that's the reason nothing, I was nothing about that. Ukraine without Ukraine. I, right. uh, if Zelensky wants to sit down with China and make peace, I thought we're, we just want to help Ukraine. Right. I thought we're just I, I thought we're just little helpers. Well, that's a break from what Biden himself said when the news broke that China was trying to broker a deal. Biden didn't come out and say, oh, no, they better not. He just kind of shrugged it off, right, because he said, well, they have an economic interest in this. This doesn't suggest at all that they are emerging as the new dominant world power as the referee in these things <laughs> yeah. right but he didn't he didn't talk that tough he didn't say they better not do it he didn't say they have to stand down it's illegal for them to do it i mean that's just the, absurd this, the, this is this is what the american people have to understand the world fucking hates us at this point and we've earned it if china can credibly step forward and demonstrate hey 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 you might not like how we treat our people at home, but we're going to be much more responsible actors on the world stage than the United States, because we, we, as a culture, we have never had imperial ambitions. Um, right. That's going to have a lot of appeal to the world. Like, yeah. it, it, like choosing exactly. between yeah. the American right. scumbaggery and the Chinese scumbaggery. Why would you not choose the Chinese variety that is not so belligerent and doesn't take up as much space? Yeah, and it doesn't seek can, to can you imagine a China way of life the way the West right. does? Right, right. It's can just you a imagine different culture. A, will China ever put hundreds of military bases around the world? That would be right. antithetical to everything we know about Chinese history. Right. So it's, it's just not the way they think. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so. Let me take a couple super chats here. Uh, we had some come in. David Young. Bush, you're either with us or with the terrorists. John Kerry in 2004, I will fight a smarter war on terrorism, the two-party system in a nutshell. Well, yeah, I mean, look, they, they didn't want, I mean, the Democrats didn't want to nominate someone who didn't, I guess, originally support the Iraq war. I mean, they really dug their own grave in that race. You talk about a blown election. Like they they were afraid to make a case against the war. They had to kind of make a case against the war using the argument that Bush had botched the war, but they couldn't just nominate an anti-war candidate because the war had 50 percent support at the time. And so, you know, that became a very, very difficult race to win. They nominated a horrible candidate. They had very, very poor choices that year. Um, they probably did not do a lot of recruiting uh, heading into that cycle, since until the Iraq war launched and proved to be such a nightmare, the Democrats probably figured they had no chance in hell of winning that year, right? That was uh, uh, Bush my, is a wartime president. My, my favorite, but yeah, you're right. My favorite Kerry line was, who amongst us does not love NASCAR? <laughs> yeah, no, that it was, was that, that was the best Kerry line. That was a tough, tough campaign, and I was very invested in it. Like I said, I was... I missed the voting deadline by a month because the election was November 2004 and I turned 18 in December that year. But that was tough because you really felt like a lot was on the line, as horrible as Kerry was. I mean, you really felt like a lot was on the line just because, and this is why I keep saying, people just do not, and you know, the Gen Zers have an excuse they were nine or, you know, at the time or five at the time. You know, even people my age, though, I got to say, man, like, yeah, I was more into this shit than the average kid, but. It was out there for all to see. I mean, it was plainly obvious what absolute ghouls were running the country at that time. Right. Even if you even even not not even thinking of issues of war and peace. We got into this in the J.K. Rowling bit. 
you know, people call her the symbol of Christian fat. These guys were fucking, I mean, these guys were as radical as it gets on that score. They won in 2004 by putting gay marriage on the ballot uh, well, in Ohio well, well, and you ginning know up anti-LGBT sentiment. I mean, these are just absolute monsters in every single respect. And we haven't seen that in a long time because, uh, you know, Trump was just throwing red meat to that part of the Republican base, but nobody ever thought he actually believed this crap. Right. Nobody ever thought Trump was actually a Christian theocrat. He just right. played one on TV. No one thought he act. They didn't even think he actually believed any of this stuff. Um, the next one, you're not going to be so lucky. Right? We're gonna, it, it, People are going to be reminded of what it was like to have real Christian fanatic in the White House. Yeah. No, I believe you are. You may very well be right about that. Long story short, Russ, do you remember the Desert Storm baseball card? See, that's before I, my time. I I do. I do remember them. That um, was when you were coming of age in the way that I was during the second Iraq. Well, War. you know what? I, I was I was thinking of that. OK, so by the time the Iraq War broke out, um, everybody knew the draft was done. Right. We were never gonna have that again or unless you know just the apocalypse right unless, unless like aliens invade um but we had not had a real war since vietnam so and and because gen x was so bombarded with boomer imagery our whole lives when the iraq war broke out a lot of people thought like this is going to be like vietnam there, there's going to be a draft because it just it, it just it was the first time we really had a war without a draft so it was just assumed like right. now we're in war there's going to be a draft so i was in college and there was a lot of fear on the campus about it um i i i told people i was like they're not going to fucking do that there's a reason they stopped doing it because the the quality of what they they get through a draft is just not worth it it's just not worth it. You got too many people who don't want to be there. They have discipline problems. There's also got, a lot more pressure you got, you to got justify people kill, the war. Killing the officers up in the jungle. <laughs> well, there's also a lot more pressure to justify the war to the public sure. when, when there's a draft, right? Exactly. Exactly. This way, they can they can just uh, kill the poor kids. Yeah, they'll just send AOC to a high school in the Bronx. She'll sucker That's all the poor it. kids into signing up. There you go. Right. right. Beautiful. You got you got you got AOC for it. How bad can it be? Yeah, right. Exactly. Courtney Conover. I hope I'm saying your last name right, Courtney, but thank you. We recognize you from the chat and from Twitter. And I believe, Courtney, you were on Misty's radio show fairly recently, if I recall correctly. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. They, yeah so, they, folks, if they you wandered in late, we're going to be uh, joining Misty Winston on her radio show. It's an internet radio show. In fact, let me put the link in here. It's tntradio.live. So we're going to be on there at 11 p.m. If you go to tntradio.live, they're a 24-hour internet radio station. And so you'll be able to just listen in live. We'll be uh, live with Misty in about 40 minutes. I keep checking my phone to see if the producer sent me the yeah, uh, the invite yet. I haven't gotten it yet. All right, well, we'll probably do it at 1030, be my guess. Um, but, yeah, we'll be on there. That'll be a lot of fun. I appeared on Misty's show by myself while Russell was in India. And now we're going to be both guesting on that show in about forty minutes. That's why we're on she, here. Tonight. She left the uh, she left the topics up to us. So uh, we're going to discuss um, how bad the book of Boba Fett was. Yeah, right. yeah. Russell's been itching to talk about that. He keeps pitching that to me, and I say no. Yeah. I keep rejecting it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it. This is completely a joke. I could give a yeah. fuck. <laughs> I I, fi I find the overall arc of what's happened with Disney interesting, and I've covered it on the show a couple times. But uh, the actual shows themselves, I want. I'm a fucking yeah. grown. I'm a grown goddamn man. I don't care about a fucking Star Wars show. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Uh, it, no. No. Really. It's 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 weird. Like when they did the sequel trilogy recently. Right. Uh, yeah. I mean, I guess it's partly because the brand had already been kind of destroyed, but it wasn't just that. Like, yeah, man. I you know past a certain point, like. The people on the dark side, the people on the light side. Like, it's just not, it's it's not something that's going to interest you. You know, these are, these are movies for children. That's what they are, right? 
Indeed. Indeed. Granite Liberty, thank you for the five dollars. You appreciate that, folks. But thank you for all the super chats. It really is helpful. Uh, we had some new patrons sign up last night while we were doing the stream. We actually added, I believe, four overnight. We're going to do our patrons scroll in a little while before we wrap. But uh, yeah, all these donations, the patron memberships, they are what allow us to come on here uh, on a night like this and add a third show. So you know that it it all helps. Thank you so much. Friedman and Hillary are why I can never take the so-called sensible them seriously. Contrast them with Robert Byrd, pardon me, and Ron Paul at that time. Yeah, no, I mean, look, it's uh, absolutely. I mean, look, we, we talked about this, uh, I think it was last night, where we talked about how the center is really just defined as the elite consensus that they impose on the population through propaganda. Yeah. Um, you know, that that's all that is. That doesn't represent an actual center at all. Um, so yeah, no, I think Well, that, that and that's why point. I mean a, any anyone who's in that bubble when you make that point to them because their media won't tell them that, it, it, they have no idea. When you tell them like public opinion actually is nothing like what they tell you it is. Like the center, it, the the country is not economically uh conservative and socially liberal it's the opposite <laughs> you know, like that's where the country really is uh yeah. if you look at the polling you've got a country that it's i mean it's complicated you got a country that wants to build a wall on the southern border but it wants to legalize pot and tax the rich you know it's complicated it's nothing like what they tell you the center is there, there was a there was a great article. Um, I think it was called Democrats can stop worrying about the center because it doesn't exist. And if you Google that, it was a great article showing like all the numbers. Of oh, what yeah. The average yeah. I remember that. Is. That came out not too long ago. I think. That was no, no, long. no. That came out back in like 2020 campaign cycle. Right. Well, that's what I mean. Uh, yeah, 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 exactly. Um, all right, let's do our patron scroll here before we sign off. Do you think we have time for the Ron DeSantis segment or not? It's getting a little late. That's it's getting a little I, close. I, I mean, if we, you know, if we if we move it along. All right, we'll try it. Fuck it. Fuck it. Do it live. We'll go for it. Fuck it. We'll do it live. Yeah. Um, so yeah, all right. So we got one more segment here that we'll try and squeeze in under the wire. We do have a hard out though in about 15 minutes. Um, but Ron DeSantis was asked today about the potential Trump arrest slash indictment tomorrow in New York. And uh this is a two-part little clip that we'll play here. Here's the first part of what he had to say about it. To New York. So I've seen rumors swirl. I have not seen any facts uh, yet, and so I don't know what's going to happen. But I do know this. The, the Manhattan district attorney is a Soros-funded prosecutor. And so he, like other Soros-funded prosecutors, they weaponize their office to impose a political agenda on society at the expense of the rule of law and public safety. He has downgraded over 50 percent of the felonies to misdemeanors. He says he doesn't want to even have jail time for the vast, vast majority of crimes. And what we've seen in Manhattan is we've seen the, sky, the, the crime rate go up and we've seen citizens become less safe. And so you're talking about this situation with, and look, I don't know what goes into paying hush money to a porn star to, to secure silence over some type of alleged affair. Ooh, I just I can't there. speak to that. But what I can I smell speak a rat. to... I smell a is rat. That Do if you, you smell have that? a prosecutor, I, I smell a guy who's going who to announce his run pretty soon. Crimes <laughs> happening every single day in his jurisdiction, and he chooses to go back many, many years ago uh, to try to use something about po porn star hush money payments. Said it again. You know that's an example of figuring out a way to a pepper it in there. Agenda and weaponizing the office, and um, I think that that's fundamentally wrong. All right, so he starts out by really playing that very cagey, but like it's terrible that he would pursue charges related to hush money to a porn star. Did I mention, you know, I don't know anything about hush money to a porn star, unlike my non-opponent, Donald Trump, who knows a lot about hush money to a porn star. It's really a terrible thing that the guy did there. So a little shrewd move. I do want to address this, by the way. Now, Sorry, you, before I toss to you, let me just get this out of the way, because 
virtuoso no call in access for today uh, no well the thing is this we, we decided to do this an hour before we went live so i promised call in access to the regularly scheduled ones but this one we pulled together last minute and we have a hard out you know at 10 40 at the very latest so i didn't want to take calls because then we could be here too late and not get everything done but uh you could always call in uh we'll we, you know we'll open the lines back up on thursday thank you my friend sorry go ahead um from what I understand, Ron knows everything there is to be known about the furry subculture. So if the charges were yeah. around that, yeah. <laughs> he could tell you all about which mascot suits are most comfortable for when you're getting down with your significant yeah. other. <laughs> but <laughs> but yeah, he. It, this is why I keep saying anytime people say, Look at how he took out 12 Republicans in the primary. Ron DeSantis, they were a bunch of fucking meatballs. Donald Trump has been very lucky in his enemies. Jeb? Jeb? <laughs> Come on. Marco Rubio? I, you know, I mean, he's passable, but I wouldn't call him a great political talent by any means. No. Uh, Ted, Ted, Ted Cruz is, is like a creepy lizard person who got lost on earth and decided to just go with it and become a politician. Um, Chris Christie probably had the most political talent in that crew. And, and, and what, when was the last time we elected a fat man? What, what, what was his name? Uh, oh, it was Garrison. I mean, yeah. It was something Ga Ga like Tyler. That. No, which, I don't think Tyler one, was it fat. wasn't Tyler. Was it Garrison? Was it Taft? Was Taft fat? Taft. Taft. Taft yeah. Was a, yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah, listen, man, and and yeah, it sounds like that a joke, should have been Trump's nickname for Christie. It's Taft. They should, should have called him <laughs> Krispy Kreme. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but it's true. I mean, it's true. Like that that does have an impact on uh, on your prospects. Uh, we 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 know the taller the taller candidate usually wins. You know, I mean, these things do affect uh, people's perception. And also, I mean, Chris Christie's act was was in the same ballpark as trump's act and you couldn't out trump him right 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 exactly. like he was it was it was that was like a warm-up act compared to what trump was doing um desantis is not these people he's he's a smart shrewd accomplished politician with a lot of uh experience and a lot of practice uh trump's not going to roll over him like that look look at that that's very clever you know, he'll do shit like that to him when he's on a debate stage with him and it's going to work like tr remember Trump's debates with Hillary. He wasn't good. It's just that she was so fundamentally unlikable that it didn't matter. Right. Right. Um, all right. Let's play the second part of this, because this drew the ire of Matt Walsh and a lot of people in conservative media because there's some kind of theory that DeSantis can fight this indictment because oh, Trump by lives the way. in Florida. And so he does, he can somehow, what, not extradite? I heard him talk about extraditing him to New York. I don't know that that's even a thing. I, I, I mean, we'll, you, we'll, we'll, you we'll do, research you... this more if and when it comes up because we'll see what happens tomorrow. Um, and I just want to say we might be burying the lead here because what the hell was the subject of this press conference? Because he's got this thing, Big Brother's Digital Dollar on the podium. And I'm hearing a lot of people theorizing that what's going on with the regional banks is basically the Fed trying to take out the smaller banks in order to centralize everything in preparation for getting everyone on the digital dollar, which they can then pull a Canadian truckers with any time that they want to just cut off your money because your money is digital. Well, I will remind you, we have a hard out in 10 minutes, so we can't. I, I'm get just into saying, too much because tonight, I, no, I was looking at the podium say. and I was yeah, like, no, no, I know are, we, are we burying the lead? What was this <laughs> press conference about? Is he, well, is, is he, is he siding with that theory? Like what's going on here? What well, was this? Maybe we'll look into that for Thursday, but uh, yeah, I didn't. I don't know. These were the only clips that we saw surfacing because here in this clip, he basically punts on whether or not he's going to come to Trump's defense, and a lot of right wing media people who were warming to DeSantis, but still obviously have a soft spot for Trump, were upset that he didn't sufficiently defend him in this next part uh, of that question. Yeah, yeah. So let's go to clip two. Of, um, our 
our, our, we are not involved in this, won't be involved in this. Uh, I have no interest in getting involved in some type of manufactured circus by some Soros DA, okay? He's trying to do a political spectacle. He's trying to virtue signal for his base. Uh, I've got real issues I've got to deal with here in the state of Florida. We're obviously shutting down uh, CBDC, which is important. We've got so many things pending in front of the legislature. Uh, I've got to spend my time on issues that actually matter to people. Uh, I can't spend my time uh, worrying about uh, things, things of that nature. So, so we're not going to be involved in it in any way. Um, I'm fighting for Floridians, and I'm fighting back against Biden. That's what I do every single day. All right, so there's another sort of KG Weasley having it both ways because he's basically saying out of one side of his mouth, I'm not going to defend Trump on this. But on the other side, he's saying, I'm not going to defend Trump on this because this is a show trial, because this is a mm-hmm. political circus. So he's like he's acting as if he's above it all, uh, which does sort of dismiss the seriousness of whatever charges are brought against Trump. So he kind of maybe tries to score a little points that way. But then he also stops short of defending Trump by saying this is beneath me as the governor of a state. I'm not going to get involved in this. Um, Now, that was not as successful because obviously the conservative media seemed to kind of see through that and not appreciate that he didn't go to bat for Trump stronger. So that was a little bit of a weaker second half there. But same basic thing, right? Trying to sort of play both sides, have it both ways. Uh, which is something he's generally pretty good at. I wasn't as successful in that second part, but that certainly was the same aim. Uh, He's between a rock and a hard place, because if you're him, do you actually want to get caught up in some kind of nonsense about trying not to extradite him? I don't even think that's a thing. You do have to extradite the person from the one state to the other. But can can they say no? I, I don't think I've ever heard of that. I haven't heard of that either. You were talking about earlier. You said this isn't, what is this, Ecuador? And I thought it would be. I would like to see Ron DeSantis get mad. He seems like a guy who would be funny when he's mad, right? Seems like a guy who would answer, what is this, fucking Ecuador? This isn't fucking Ecuador, you know? It'd get a little little Joe Pesci with it. Yeah, get a little Joe Pesci, right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, By the way, uh, Russ, I just got the email from the producer, so if you want to just open your email and just... Send him a quick got yeah, it. Thanks. See you soon. It. Just so he knows we're yeah. we're not going to bail. That'd be awesome. All right. So, yeah, we got the email for our next uh, appearance here. So we got to do some super chats and uh, hit the road. But thank you guys for joining us on this impromptu stream. This was a lot of fun. We thank you guys very, very much. We had a nice crowd in here. Axel, Brandon, uh, let's go, Brandon. Thanks for the two bucks. That DeSantis pick is looking more and more loose. What does loose mean? Is loose? Yeah, what is do you loose, mean by loose? Is that Louise, Is that by you for good? Does loose mean good? Yeah. The loose? <laughs> right on. Does loose mean dumb? I don't know. I never heard the word loose used in that, uh, that, that context before. But thank you, Brandon. Thanks, PMC, for the $1.99. Really appreciate that. Christian Drake. Thank you for the $10, my friend. Much appreciated. DeSantis had all the time in the world to prepare for facing Donald in a primary. The Never Trump or MSNBC Republican cavalcade will jump into his lap and call him daddy. Everything is proceeding as I have foreseen. (laughs) We will see about that um, because the MSNBC crowd, I mean, they know where their bread is buttered right now. And, you know, they are all in on DeSantis is the tropical Hitler. You know what I mean? Like (laughs) they're Trump's the Northeast Hitler. And, you know, you know, uh, so I don't know how much treatment, how much good treatment he's going to get from like those Lincoln project types because they're in business now. They already got their shop set up. And if they had any principles, they wouldn't be neocon Republicans anyway. Well, this is well, this is something um, that there's one conservative. I watch his channels, the black conservative, and he was showing um, whoever the resident conservative of the week is on the on the view right now or this season or whatever um was was you know talking about how we've got to reelect biden and he was saying you know at this point i don't know how these people claim to be the conservative voice on the show or the republican voice on the show they're democrats and it's true i mean if you're steve schmidt that's it i mean that bridge is burned you know you're making your money off the lips 
you can't turn on them now. It be being the being the uh, the good cuddly Republican that's your brand now. You can't you right, can't right. you can't back a Republican. So so I mean it's interesting. Like any of them that actually have politics, I I would think DeSantis would be very appealing to them. So do you get some of them that go home? to the party once it it's not Trump who's so offensive to them running. It's an interesting I mean, question. I mean, interesting. a guy like Schmitz, you know, or, or Nicole Wallace, like never, but some of them, maybe like the Rick Wilson's. I mean, I don't know to me, like those kinds of Republicans were always more about their own interests than they were about actual politics. Like it was always very difficult to discern where their personal interests ended and their right. politics began. Right. They were just, right. it was the right. same thing. They're people with a lot of money who don't want to give any of it away. And so right. they're right. in the GOP for that reason. Right. Um, so, you know, I, I have no idea. Somebody mentioned Anna Navarro. She's the daughter of the Contra. Yeah. No, look, yeah, she, yeah. she, she's a woke centrist uh, lib now. She's not right. going back. That, That's right. right. You know, she's, she's getting paid now. All these people were ever about is getting paid. Right. And right. the Republicans not only paid them, but the Republicans kept their taxes low. So it was a really sweet gig for them. Now the Democrats are paying them and the Democrats, in theory, want to take a few more tax dollars from them. But, you know, but, but in reality, they'll never do it. In reality, they'll never do it. So they'll it's, win, it's a pretty win. good deal to stay with the Democrats. Exactly. Because they're paying them. They're paying them a lot better. I mean, these these, you know, when uh, like on, on the Republican side of the aisle, like. They were never stars. David Frum was never a star. He was a sad sack. He was a speech writer. He was a paper shuffler. He was a nobody. Right. He was middleman, right? right? right. Now right. he's editor of The Atlantic. He's editor-in-chief right. of a major newspaper, right? right? right. Uh, Steve Schmidt, Rick Wilson, these guys were nobodies. They were apparatchiks. Mm -hmm. Now they're the Lincoln Project. Now they're, they're superstars in that space. They're not going to go back. No, I don't think so. I don't think so. If a if a candidate like a Nikki Haley broke through, maybe, maybe well, because, because she's well, very close no, to because their politics. Then they, then they could keep their gig, right? They could keep their gig because yes, DeSantis with the with the uh, uh, going after Disney and don't say gay. Yeah, no, 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 no. it's too much. Like that's no. the, that's just they can't they can't uh, still be good friends with people on the other side of the aisle working together and having honest disagreements that they, they can't play that once you back DeSantis. Exactly. exactly. Actually, when I've seen clips of the view now, like, you know, man, Cindy McCain was a fucking idiot, but at least she actually represented an opposing point of view. Oh, that was it. You were done. Sorry. I just put the patron scroll up there since we can get it in before we have to leave. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's what I got. Like you watch it now and you're like, there's just no, they're all just shit lips. Like, yeah. like the black conservative is right. Like in, okay. So they're conservatives. How? Right. Like they're all up <laughs> there in agreement. Yes. Biden, Kamala, everyone hates Kamala because they're racists and you know, they're all on the same page. Right. So I like, why even pretend that you're putting conservatives on the show? No, of course. Of course. It's all the same brand at this point. Right. Like McCain, at least she actually right. did have an opposing viewpoint. Right, right. No, I, I see what you're saying. All right, folks. Well, that is our show for the evening. We want to thank our patrons for making shows like this happen. We have two patron scrolls right now because we had an overflow. I reached my character limit for the first patron scroll. And so as the first patron scroll ends, a second one will start. That's one more thing I have to keep track of on the show right here but thank you guys very much for joining this evening this was a lot of fun hang on we got we got we got one more super chat here okay from, go ahead throw from it up. axel all right loose meaning bad trump is going to get a huge bump in the primaries here on the Sun Belt for literally being a rebel now the south loves a rebel well listen man you're not the only one who disagrees with me about this and and i think you know, Keaton, I think we could trust him to hold the money, man. If you all want to start making some bets with me on this, I'll say the, the, the OTB window is open.
All right. Yeah, that's the only response we have time for right now uh, because we have to get out of here in less than a minute, literally. But thank you, Brandon. We always appreciate you. Brandon's one of our OG supporters from way back in the day. OG. He's been here since the beginning. Since the beginning. We love Brandon. And here are our four new... Where is he? He's Lafayette, Louisiana. Yeah, he's in Louisiana. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's why I thought maybe loose was like a southern phrase that we didn't understand or something like that. Nah, nah, I fit. Nah. Lit. Sir, you have insulted me. I challenge <laughs> you to a game of billiards. All right, we got our new, our new patrons here. Kevin K, Michael M, Jeff H, and Justin B. You guys all signed up last night during the show last night. So thank you guys all so much. That was very, very kind of you. We appreciate it. All right, guys, we have to get out of here. Go to tntradio.live. TN is in Nathan Radio.live. I heard the link wasn't working right, but tntradio.live. We will be on there with our friend Misty Winston in 20 minutes. We've got a hard out right now, so we are going to get over there so we are not late. Thank you guys so much for joining. This was a lot of fun. We will see you guys back here on Thursday. Be safe. Be well. Please clap. Please <laughs> clap.